What a life-changing experience to finally meet someone who doesn't hesitate to put it on you or on your tendency to indulge in blame or procrastination. That is indeed a banner day when you meet someone who has learned how to skillfully and carefully attack the same problem that has kept you from doing very well or kept you beneath your potential or kept you off balance as to your own self-worth. It is so easy to mistake appearances for reality, to confuse the symptom with the real cause. Along with blame comes the third negative tendency we want to eliminate, excuses. Guess how many excuses we have? A million. And in the course of a lifetime, we will probably use them all, unless somebody finally comes along and blows all those excuses apart to make us come face to face with the real reasons for our current dilemma. Until that time, we will probably use another million excuses to prevent ourselves from having a million dollars. You see, it's not what happens that determines the quality or the quantity of your life. It's not what happens. And the reason is because what happens, happens to about everybody. The sun went down on all of us last night, a common event. And I found out the same things can happen to two different people, but one gets rich and the other stays poor. Why is that? It's because it's not what happens, but rather it's what you do about it. That is an important phrase for your written and mental notes. It's not what happens. It's what you do that makes the difference in how your life works out. What happens is about the same for everybody. It's what people do that makes the difference. Anything can happen, right? I've heard all of the stories. Hey, I've been one of the stories. We could all tell stories for days on end. Anything can happen. Have you heard of Murphy's Laws? Surely you have. Murph had these laws. One of the laws was, if anything can go wrong, it will. That's one of Murphy's Laws. Anything can happen. I've fallen out of the sky so many times once to the tune of a couple of million. Devastating. Took me a while to get over that one. Now, it wasn't all that much, but it was all I had. That's much, right? When it's all you've got. If you've got three and two go and you've got one left, you aren't looking that bad, but when it all goes. I'm sure you've had that kind of experience. Of course, a long time ago, when you ran out of money and got to zero, you were all through. Heck, now you can whistle right on by zero, right? They will bury you these days. But those are happenings. Everyone's got the same happenings. The big question is, what are you going to do about it? So I have a challenge for every one of you this weekend. The challenge is simple. As you go through your weekend, and sometimes it's kind of a, hopefully an easier time of your week, ask yourself, Am I practicing self-discipline in my life? Am I doing the things that I should do because I need to do them? Or am I kind of waiting to feel the moment? Do like our friends Nike say, just do it. So I applaud you for your dreaming, for your running toward your dream. I applaud you for believing in yourself because that's what life is about stretching and challenging, looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. Not only is it possible for you to have your dream, but it's necessary, it's necessary that you go for what is yours in the universe. How many of you know if you'd have been more disciplined, you'd be further along to reach your goals right now? Socrates said the undisciplined life is an insane life. Make it okay to fail. A lot of people, 85% of people, allow their fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. Repeat after me, please. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. Yeah, see, anything is worth doing is worth doing right, as we have been taught, if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, it's worth doing badly until you get it right. But most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely tiptoeing to an early grade. We've been holding back. We have ideas that we don't act on, things we want to do. We're afraid to take chances. 
See, a lot of people say no to things and they don't even know what they're saying no to. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner. When you start to say to yourself, I'm going to do it anyway, what happens is something really cool. You acknowledge that there are feelings that you have that are trying to swoop in and hijack you. You acknowledge them and you basically say, guess what? I'm going to do it anyway. All that positive thinking and how you think and what you determine your destiny to be, it works. You must prepare your mind to be happy. You gotta take action now. You gotta take action now. Make today your masterpiece. To becoming successful, whether it's in a business, whether it's working with someone or for someone or in your own personal life. And I learned this selling encyclopedias door to door in my early twenties is be prepared in life for a lot of rejection. Because if you're prepared for a lot of rejection and it comes, you don't get turned off, you don't get disappointed, like, well, I'm not going to do this anymore, no one thinks it's a good idea. It's like I, I say selling encyclopedias, knocking on 100 doors, they slam them in your face. You must be just as enthusiastic on door number 101 as door number one. And that's one of the real secrets. And growing up as kids in downtown L.A., we all knew that. We didn't have a lot. We knew there's a lot of things that are going to turn you down. At seven, trying to sell a flower pot on the street, most people said no, but it's only 50 cents. No, no, no. Soon a waitress in a little restaurant said, only 50 cents? That's really great. She bought it from us. And we went and built another one. That, you don't that, give up. That really is like one of the secrets to the universe, in my opinion, that ability to stay as enthusiastic on door 101 as you were on door one when you had it slammed in your face over and over and over. How... Is that something you can teach? Like, in fact, have you parted that onto your kids? Like, is that something that they've adopted? And if so, how did you pull that off? Definitely. It's just like your viewers of your fabulous show here. They've just heard me say that. Now, if they write that on a piece of paper, be prepared for a lot of rejection. Whether it's in their personal life that someone says, you're too old, you're too fat, you're too young, you're not going to do anything other than yes. You've got holes in your nose, you've got things coming out your ears. Whatever is other than yes, this is wonderful. Realize that's going to happen in life. As soon as people know that, when something goes wrong, they look at a piece of paper. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. The other quote that I give people a lot, especially entrepreneurs, uh, is any business you're in, whether it's a service or whether it's a product, or anybody you work with that has a product or a service, always make sure that your product or your service is of the highest quality you could ever make it because you do not want to be. You do not want to be in the selling business. You want to be in the reorder business. Granted, you've got to tell somebody what your idea is and, you know, and how it's going to cure something they may need. But the quality has to be so good that after that they want to reorder it, or if it's a one-time item, tell friends about it. And if people think, and whatever they're doing in life, be in the reorder business, whether it's with a personal relationship, whatever you see right now, you're gonna see again and again and again, it's gonna enhance, there'll be ups and downs. Here's my product, it's so darn good, you're gonna use it. Uh, we started Paul Mitchell, we had no money, but we knew our product was so darn good that if we got in the hands of enough people, they're gonna be reordering it because it was that quality. Service the same way. I have a, um, from an emotional standpoint, I am I will put myself in the almost emotionally invulnerable, invincible, invincible yeah, <laughs> position. Like I've, I've spent an inordinate amount of time on that. But I would have to process through some real fear, even if it was just, okay, now what happens to my wife? What happens to my family? So how did you deal with that? Um, here's an important piece of this is when it comes to accepting all things that you can't change, death is one of those things. So I made peace with death a long time ago. And, and I think that death is a big fear for all of us. And to me, it, I've gotten to the point where I realize it doesn't even make sense for that to be a fear. For, for anything that's inevitable or that you can't change, right? That there's no point in, in, in resisting it and wishing it weren't going to happen. And, and the way that I look at death is it's the other side of birth. And we don't fear birth, Right, But birth and death are both just as inevitable, and they're two sides of the same coin that is life, right? But I, oh man, I, it's, that's the one thing I've heard you say where I was like, ah. and, and I'll say why. Birth gives, death takes, or such is my perception right now, and maybe you're about to give me a breakthrough, and I'm so <laughs> fucking open to that you can't imagine, yeah. but like, 
the the thing that that I really want to understand, like how you've dealt with it internally, is that that um, what and maybe I'm packaging it wrong when I say it out loud, but that sense of I want something so badly, and thusly I am terrified to lose it, and the the wanting is so powerful and so important and so beautiful that I know I don't want to give that up, but yet it creates the fear. It, it is the, I mean, like the old Buddhist notion of life is suffering because you want things, because you want things and you may not get them, because you want things, you may lose them. Like the love for a child, I imagine, I'm not a parent, I imagine is transformatively profound, but it fucking sucks you in, dude. And it gets you to the point where now, like right now, I'm not afraid to die except for my wife. Legitimately, for myself, eh, whatever. Like, I I won't say that I'm not bothered, but it's like not a grand fear of mine. Even though I talk a lot about living forever, that's me moving towards something, not away from, I don't, I'm not moving away from death. I'm moving towards the things I would be able to do if I could live forever. Thank you. The thought of having kids or the thought of leaving my wife behind, that shit makes me emotional. Yeah. And so I really want to know, like, how did you process through that? Because in there somewhere is, is a breakthrough for me, if nobody else. Yeah. So that was the hardest thing. Like I said, because I've made peace with death, I was imagining my wife and my kids losing me, um, especially my kids. Like the, the, the most important thing in my world, in my life, is that I can influence my children in a positive way to set them up for a great life, right? Um, and so that, that, that I might not have that opportunity was the, the hardest thing to deal with. I think that part of it is I didn't spend a lot of time on thinking about that, right? So that's the thing is people that have a lot of fear, you're thinking about the things that you're afraid of, right? You don't have the fear of, unless you're not thinking, right? If you're not thinking about the thing you're afraid of, but as soon as you're thinking about it, the fear comes up. So for me, um, I use affirmations a lot too. That's one of the miracle morning practices is affirmations. And affirmations, I think, have a kind of a bad rap, you know, like Stuart Smalley, you know, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people like me. And then they're taught by like a lot of self-help pioneers is like, lie to yourself. If you want to be a millionaire, just say, I am a millionaire over and over and over until you believe it, right? But we're, if we know the truth, if you're like, I'm a millionaire, you know, your brain's like, dude, no, you're not, right? You're like, shut up, I'm doing my affirmations, right? Like, so anyway, the point is, the way that I view affirmations is they simply direct your focus on wherever you want your focus directed. So you can literally, like a computer program, you can go, okay, what are the beliefs that I want to focus on so they expand inside of me? Even the thoughts that I want to focus on. What are my values? What are the behaviors that I need to embody, right? So, so you read these affirmations every day and you're programming yourself to live in alignment with that program that you've designed.